So let's see the, the plan for the next few lectures. As I told you last time, is going to be to, to develop a geometric way of thinking about coxeter groups. Okay. And uh, last time we talked about this example, which we have talked about before, and how you can think of this as a nice geometric model for the symmetric group S3. And uh, so, so the idea is, is basically that if you consider two mirrors that are at an angle of pi over 3, and <coughs> the group generated by reflections across those mirrors, then that will be a, a way of thinking about this, this symmetric group. Now the key, of course, is that these guys that are at, a, at an angle of pi over 3, so we've seen several times already that then if you reflect by S1 and then by S2, or actually this is the other way around, right? If you reflect by S2 and then by S1, it's going to be a rotation by twice the angle. A rotation by 2 pi over 3. And what that means is that if you do it three times, you're not doing anything. And so, of course, the key and the reason that we are able to, to make this model is this angle, that, that we can just make two hyperplanes that are at an angle pi over 3. Okay. Now, what can I say about this in general? Well, this is going to be the geometric representation of a Coxeter group. And we talked a little bit about this already once. But I want to talk about it now in much more detail. So the idea, I can, repre I can represent as 3 by 2 reflections by a 60 degree angle. At an angle of pi over 3. And so the question is, Is it possible that I can do this for any Coxeter group? Can I do this for any Coxeter group? And what I mean basically then is can I get reflections at the correct angle so that the Coxeter group is modeled correctly? So can I do this for any W, any Coxeter group? Now. It's going to turn out that you, you can't always do it in Euclidean geometry. Okay? So you can't always get the angles right in Euclidean geometry. Get all the angles right. Okay? But then. What you can do is change the way that you measure angles. Okay? And then this works. So you can do this if you change how you measure angles. And so basically, that's how we're going to pull this off. Okay. So let's say that I start with a Coxeter system. So that comes with a Coxeter matrix M. So what I want to do is the following. Let's say that the reflections are called S1 up to Sn. Okay. So what I'm going to do is first build the vector space where my representation is going to live. We call it B. And 
And let's say that alpha 1 up to alpha n is some basis that I choose. Okay? I should say that this is a real vector space. Okay? So it's a vector space where the scalars are reals. Now, what I, what I would hopefully like to do is, is make this just be some vector space that's very natural and choose my basis so that the angles are what I want them to be. Okay? And that's what I succeeded in doing here for the symmetric group S3. I succeeded in building a model in uh, Euclidean space R2. And the way I did that was by choosing this special basis alpha 1, alpha 2, where it's not the usual orthogonal basis that we might take, uh, orthonormal basis. It's a basis where it turns out to be more convenient to make these guys be at an angle of 2 pi over 3 so that they have this property. Okay? Now, what I want to think is that I would like basically these guys to have the correct angles. The point is that that's not always possible in Euclidean space. But so what I do is choose a bilinear form. Form. So what a bilinear form does is that it uh, assigns to each pair of vectors a real number. Okay? And this is kind of like a generalization of the, of the dot product in, in Euclidean geometry. And the way that I define it is that I define basically what is alpha i comma alpha j. And that will define my bilinear form completely. I'll say a little bit more about this in a second. Uh, but to, to determine a bilinear form, you just have to say what it is on a basis. And so what I want it to be is, is basically what it would be if alpha i and alpha j were Euclidean vectors that were at an angle, at the angle that I wanted to be. Okay. So I make this minus cosine of pi over m i So let's go back to this example and talk about this, except that now I want you to forget that this is Euclidean, the Euclidean plane. If I were to do this abstractly, then basically I'm just thinking that this is some, there's no angle here. So it's just some vector space. The basis is alpha 1 and alpha 2. And I'm just defining. A bilinear form, and it's defined by its values on on the basis. Okay, and and this is just basically minus cosine of pi over what's m one one. Well, if you remember that every Coxeter matrix has to have ones on the diagonal. So this one is one, is one. This one is one. And then these guys are pi over three and pi over three. Okay. And uh, so cosine of pi is negative one. So this is one. This is 1. And cosine of pi over 3 is a half. So, so this is how I define my bilinear form. Now, for example, how would I, how would I know what the bilinear form is on v, comma, w for some random v and w in this vector space? Well, this is when I have to use that it's bilinear. And what that means is, is that it's linear in the first argument, linear in the second argument. So if I want to know what v comma w is, then what I do is that I write them in terms of the basis. Okay, So v might be, I don't know, 
x1 alpha 1 plus x2 alpha 2. W, I write it as y1 alpha 1 plus y2 alpha 2. And then I just use that this is a bilinear form, which means that I can just dis distribute the pluses and just get basically the, this, the bilinear form of this and this, plus this and this, plus this and this, plus this and this. And so what I would get is minus x1, y1, no, sorry, plus x1, y1, minus x1, y2 over 2, minus x2, y1 over 2, plus x2, y2. And so in general, I don't have this picture available to me. And so I just do this abstractly. I say I, I build my vector space. I build my, my bilinear form in this way. This defines the bilinear form at v comma w. I get some number. And I just kind of imagine in my head that this is kind of like a dot product. And, and remember that you can think of a dot product as measuring angles. Right? And so I just think that this is supposed to be measuring angles in some way. But it measures them in, in a way in which the angle between alpha i and alpha j is what I want it to be. So again, this is the key, th the key thing. So you should be thinking that the angle between the hyperplanes hi and hj is pi over m i j. Okay. And if you think that, then basically the reflection by hi and then hj is going to be a rotation by 2 pi over m i j. Okay. And then when you do that m i so let me let me say it then if you reflect by s i and s j this is rotation by 2 pi over m i j and so what you will get is that s i s j to the m i j is the identity okay. and that way we will have these geometric operations that satisfy the coxeter relations that's basically the idea so what is the geometric representation? The geometric representation is, let me make sure you, I write it very explicitly, geometric representation. It is a homomorphism from my Coxeter group to this group of linear transformations in B. And, and again, you should just be thinking that basically what I'm doing is representing the group element SI as a geometric reflection. And a reflection is a linear operator. Okay. And the way this reflection works is that it takes my vector V to the vector v minus 2 inner product of v comma alpha i alpha i. So this should look familiar to you because this is exactly the geometric representations that we talked about in lecture 8 or 9 or something like this. And we really were thinking that this is reflection by hyperplane. which is orthogonal to alpha i. Now you should notice that I'm putting quotation marks around everything. Because, for example, whenever I say angle, you should, think, you should be thinking angle, but it's not really an angle because it's not Euclidean geometry. Okay? When I say orthogonal, well, you have to be careful because this doesn't mean orthogonal in the, in the Euclidean sense. It, it means, I mean, I'll tell you what it means exactly. 
And hyperplane, again, you have to be careful what, what these words mean. Okay? But this is the geometric representation. So the geometric representation sends each generator of my coxeter group into a geometric reflection. Okay. Now, what do, what do I have to do to make sure that this really is a homomorphism? If I want to make a homomorphism from W into something, well, remember that what we, what we have to do is exactly check that whatever I'm sending the generators to, these things better satisfy the Coxeter relations. And this is what you have to do in homework one. Right? You have to check that if you want a homomorphism, then you just have to check that the images of the generators satisfy the Coxeter relations. Okay. And so to prove that this is a geometric representation, really, is, I mean, it's not just a given. And there's something to prove here, right? A map that sends a generator to this geometric operation extends uniquely to a group homomorphism from W2 the general linear group. When I say general linear group, I mean this thing, okay, and like I said, this is this is the group of linear transformations on B. Invertible linear transformations on B. Okay. Now, I should say I'm, I'm going over this a little bit quickly because it's the second time that I do it. But that doesn't mean that everything that I'm saying is necessarily clear. So any questions at this point, please ask me. So sigma i is uh, a bilinear mapping? Right? Sigma i is a linear mapping, and which is what it should be, right? Because it should be that I'm taking a generator to an element of here, which by definition is just an invertible linear mapping. Okay. Why is this thing invertible? Because we because this, we checked that this is like reflection, and so if you do sigma i times sigma i, you get the identity. And so it's invertible because it's its own inverse. Okay. It's a representation in the sense of representation theory? Like yeah. Kind of steps being inside of the matrix? Yeah, so if, so if you've ever thought about representation theory, then what we're talking about here is exactly a representation of W. Yeah, these things don't have gener uh, determinant one necessarily. Any other questions about this? Like I said, don't 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 worry too much about the notation. Just think about it in, in the way that I'm saying that you're sending each SI into a reflection, and if these reflections are going to model the Coxeter group, then they better satisfy the Coxeter relations. And so that's that's what I need to show here. So proof, what I need to show is that these linear operations satisfy the Coxeter relations. Now, what is this E? Well, remember, th where does this equation take place? These guys are linear operations, okay? And so when I write E here, I mean the identity linear operation on B. 
And so what this means is that if you apply the, the reflection sigma i, the reflection sigma j, sigma i, sigma j, sigma i, sigma j, then you're going to get the identity. Well, once I check this, then the universal property tells me that, that, that this is a homomorphism. But this is what I need to check. Okay. Okay. Now, you might be wondering why I'm doing this again, because I, I did this once, and the reason is that I did it wrong. Okay. And uh, so I did this in lecture eight, but... If you go back and, and see what I told you last time, I, I lied to you. And so, what I want is to tell you the truth today. Okay. Um, and so, let's 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 prove this. Now, let me show you a picture that you should have in mind for this proof. Let's imagine that. Let's imagine that you have some Coxeter group, and now the maybe the biggest one that I can draw is in three generators. Okay. So then the geometric representation for this guy is going to live in some three-dimensional real vector space. So that means I can I can draw this. Now, what I want to prove is is that. I mean, each one of these guys corresponds to a uh, geometric operation, a linear transformation, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. And now I would like to check, check a Coxeter relation, like this one. Okay. Now, what I want to do is the following. I want to think... something like this. Basically, each one of these guys corresponds to a, a vector. And so, things are hard to draw, but you might have something like this. So you might have three vectors that generate the space. And for each one of them, I have what I would like to call a hyperplane, except that I want to be careful what it means to be a hyperplane. What does it mean to be a hyperplane? It's not that it's orthogonal to this, because this is not Euclidean geometry. It means that according to this bilinear form, the, the product in the bilinear form of this vector with all of these guys is 0. Okay. So maybe this is my vector alpha 1. This is my vector alpha 2, and then this would be my hyperplane h1, and this would be my hyperplane h2, and then this is alpha 3 and, and h3. But I want to focus on 1 and 2. Okay. Now, and so, so this right here is, is my vector space v right here. Now, I want to say something that is going to look very obvious, but then maybe the, the the, the hardest thing is to realize why it's not obvious. Okay. These guys are a basis, okay? So they they really look like this. Now, I want to say something. I want to say that if I look at the let's look at the plane spanned by alpha one and alpha two. Okay. So here it is, some plane. Let me call it v one two. Okay. And now. <coughs> Let me consider the things that are orthogonal to v12 according to this bilinear form. Okay. So let me write this here in general, and that will be the, our example that we're looking at. So I'm going to let vij be the span of alpha i and alpha j, and then I'm going to Define something that is kind of like. So, so what is it? It's the vectors in V such that, according to this bilinear form, 
they are orthogonal to alpha i and alpha j. Okay. So if this were your Euclidean space, then this would just be the, the line perpen perpendicular to this plane. Okay. So it's going, it would look something like this. And this is the origin, right? And so I would like to make the statement that each element of my vector space can be written uniquely as a sum of something here and something here. Okay. Now we know, we know this in, in normal Euclidean geometry. And if you just look at the picture, you see it. If you want to, if you want to walk anywhere in this three-dimensional space, then you just go the right distance, and then you and then you look, get that whole plane in that way. Okay. So what I want to do is is prove the same statement here. So lemma v is the direct sum of. V i j and V i j perpendicular. So why is this not obvious? Well, you see, it's not obvious because it's not even true in general. Okay? And I'll ask you to, as an exercise, think about why this is not true if m i j is infinite. But if m i j is not infinite, then this will be true. Actually, I, I won't even leave it to you as an exercise. You, we'll see in a second why, why we need this and why this can go wrong. But the, the point is that we, we don't know if this bilinear form is well behaved or not. Okay. And we know that this is true for, for dot products, but bilinear forms can be very well very poorly behaved. For example, it's conceivable, I mean it is a bilinear form to say that the product of anything and anything is zero. Well, that's bilinear. And if I consider that one, then what would be perpendicular to this plane? So everything. And so this, would, this statement would not be true. So I need that any vector can be written uniquely as something here plus something here. Something in something in here plus something in here. Okay. So I would like something like this. V equals. Now what do things in V I J look like? V V I J is just the span of alpha uh, I and alpha J. So this part is just going to look like something like lambda i v i plus lambda j v j. And then, so this is the first part, plus something that is orthogonal to v i and v j. Let me just make this notation simpler by just saying, let me call this guy W. Where W is, is here. <coughs> okay. Now, now what? 
So basically, sorry, the, the ij is the span of alpha i and alpha j. So it should be alpha and alpha. So I'm given v, I'm given alpha i, I'm given alpha j, and I'm supposed to determine what lambda i, lambda j, and w are. And these are supposed to be determined uniquely. The thing is what? The thing is that because I'm given v, alpha i, and alpha j, I don't have a choice for those. That means that I don't have a choice for what the product of v and alpha i is. Because these things are just given to me. What I'm able to choose is lambda i and lambda j. Now, what is, what is the inner product of v and alpha i? Well, what I do is basically, because this is a bilinear form, that means I can do first this part, then this part, and then this part. Okay. So let's, let's do it. Lambda i times inner product of alpha i and alpha i plus lambda j times inner product of alpha j and alpha i, plus inner product of w and alpha i. Why is this a good thing to do? Because, again, this is given to me. What else is given to me? Well, alpha i and alpha i have an inner product that is pre predetermined. right? It's, it's given by that formula. So I don't have a choice for this. Alpha j and alpha i, I don't have a choice for that either. And what about this? It has to be 0, right? Because w is supposed to be perpendicular to alpha i and alpha j. Okay. So let me rewrite this as v comma alpha i equals lambda i times the inner product of alpha i and alpha i. How much is that? Something that I want you to realize happens in general. The inner product of alpha i and alpha i is minus cosine of pi over mii. mii is always 1. So that means that this is minus cosine of pi, which is 1. So this is just 1. Plus lambda j times that number minus cosine of pi of pi over mij. Let me just call this c for cosine. Okay. Plus zero. Okay. C is minus cosine of pi over mij. So that's what I get when I take the product of v and alpha i. Okay. And that gives me one linear equation for lambda i and lambda j, where everything else is known. I know what c is because I know the Coxeter matrix. And this inner product, I, I don't get to choose either. Yeah. So what do I do now? Well, I do the same thing with j. So what happens when I take the inner product of v and alpha j? Well, you can imagine that this thing just flips. Yeah. And so I'm left with this system of equations. And from this system of equations, I'm supposed to tell you what lambda i and lambda j are. Okay. So does this system of equations have a solution? Is it unique? How, how could this how could this not have a solution? You just have two linear equations and two variables. So when does that not have a solution? Basically when, when the right hand sides are equal and the left hand sides are different. So are the are they equal, the right hand sides? You have to be a little bit careful, right? Yeah. So if c, is, if c is 1, for example, then we might be in trouble. Because if c is 1, then these would be the same equation for on the right, but these numbers might be different. So 
could C be 1? Why is C not 1? Because that would mean that cosine of pi over mij would be negative 1. And that would mean that this is an integer, right? And so the only integer you could put into this equation is mij equals 1. And if mij is equal to 1, we know that the only ones in the cox matrix can be on the diagonal. But we're, we're choosing i and j to be different here. So this can't be. Are there any other troublesome values of c? There is another one, which is negative 1. If c is negative 1, then this tells me the value of lambda i minus lambda j. And this tells me the value of minus lambda i plus lambda j, which is the negative of that. And so I might be in trouble. If c is negative 1, I might be in trouble. So is it possible that c is negative 1? Well, if c was negative 1, then cosine of pi over mij would be 1. Cosine of what is 1? Of 0. And to get 0 here, you need basically mij to be infinite. Which it isn't by assumption, but that's why I need this assumption. Okay. But then you see that actually this theorem would be false whenever this, whenever you have two generators whose coxeter edge has a label infinity. Okay. But uh, but so we're lucky. We're lucky that this doesn't happen. This doesn't happen. Now, how can you guarantee to me that there aren't any more bad values here? thing is that a 2 by 2 system of equations can only go wrong if the determinant is 0. It's the only thing, the, the, the only thing that can go wrong. But what's the determinant here? 1 minus c squared. And so the only troublesome values would be 1 and negative 1. Okay. So because the determinant of the 2 by 2 system is not zero, that means that there's a unique solution. So that means that lambda i is determined, whatever it is, lambda j is determined. And the last thing that I should determine to get this decomposition is w, but again I have no choice for w, w just has to be v minus this. And why do I know that W is going to land in the perpendicular space? Because the equations tell me so. And so that's the end of the proof. Okay. okay. So what am, I, what am I trying to accomplish with this lemma? Well, you see, the thing is this. What, I, what I'm trying to prove is this statement. I want to prove that whenever I take sigma i, sigma j, this number of times, I get the identity. Now, this is a linear operator on b. So what, the, what this equation really means is that if you take sigma i, sigma j, sigma i, sigma j, sigma i, sigma j of some vector, you get the vector back. Okay. I want to prove this for any vector in my vector space b. How does this help? This helps because I can say the vector that I'm going to plug in here can be written as a sum of something here and something here, and to show that that vector is not touched by this operation. I'm just going to show that this piece is not touched and this piece is not touched. 
let me write that out. Now that I have my lemma. I want to show that this thing applied to any vector gives me the vector back. And so what I'm going to do is basically write v as a little v i j plus a little w, where this is in here and this is in here. And I'm going to prove this is true for this guy and this is true for this guy. So these are my two claims. Now, if I prove these two things, then basically I can just add them and get this one. Yep. And I claim that not, not only are these true, but they're, e they're easier to prove. That's the whole reason I'm doing this. For example, look at this one. Why is, why is this one easier to prove? Think about geometrically what this is saying. Now remember that v i j is in the span of alpha i and alpha j, and w is perpendicular to alpha i and alpha j. Okay. So what is this statement saying? Statement one, statement two. So I think statement two is particularly easy to prove, especially when you think about it geometrically, because what is this saying? It's saying I'm taking a vector that is perpendicular to alpha i and alpha j according to this form. And I'm saying reflect it across j, across i, across j, across i, across j, across i. But what does reflection across j do? Well, you see if, if here, here's alpha j. And here's everything that's perpendicular to alpha j. And w lives on here because it's perpendicular. So what happens when you reflect across this hyperplane? Well, nothing because this guy is on this hyperplane. Okay. So, so that's, that's the picture that I have in my head, but I have to be careful with my picture. So let me first draw it and then actually write a proof. Here's alpha j. And here are the things that are orthogonal to alpha j. What I'm saying is w is orthogonal to alpha j by definition. w lives on this hyperplane. And so that means that when I reflect w across this hyperplane, I'm not doing anything. And when I reflect w across hyperplane i, I'm not doing anything either. So not only is it true that this whole operation of w is w, but each one of these individual guys never touches w. But that requires a proof. How do I prove what I'm claiming, that sigma j doesn't touch w? Well, I have to make some computation that shows that, because I can't rely on, on my Euclidean intuition. But what does sigma j of w mean? Well, by definition, it means w minus 2 inner product of w and alpha i comma alpha i. That doesn't look very much like w. Except that when I remember that w is orthogonal to alpha i, that means that this guy is 0. Oh, yeah, sorry. It should be i or j, either way. The point is, this piece is 0, and so this is just w. And by the same reason, Sigma j of w, um, same thing, w minus 0, just w. Okay. 
And so if I apply sigma i, sigma j, sigma i, sigma j, however many times, I'm, I'm never going to leave w. So that proves this one. So that proves this one. Okay. Now, how about one? What does one mean? Well, now, okay, let me just draw the picture for you. V, V i j lives in the span of alpha i and alpha j. So let me just draw here alpha i, here alpha j, and then I'm just taking inside this plane v i j, I'm taking some vector v i j, and then I'm saying reflect across alpha i, reflect across alpha j, etc. Okay? But now you see that the thing is that this takes place in two dimensions. When I reflect this guy across alpha, the, the hyperplane of alpha i, across the hyperplane of alpha j, etc., this all takes place in two dimensions, and then, I, and then this just becomes a two-dimensional computation. Now, the intuition, again, is that the angle between, these, between the two hyperplanes is pi over m i j. And so when I apply sigma i, sigma j, this is just a rotation by 2 pi over m i j. So if I apply it m i j times, I should get back to the identity. But again, that's just intuition. Because to, to prove this, I just need to perform that computation. Okay. So, so then I just do that. I better not erase this. So, what does sigma i do to alpha i? I get alpha i minus two inner product of alpha i and alpha i, and then I get alpha i. Now the inner product of alpha i and alpha i is one, so I get alpha i minus two alpha i, which is minus alpha i. What's the intuition behind this? The intuition is that alpha i is maybe the positive normal, and so when I reflect, I get the negative normal. This is the Euclidean analog. Okay? So sigma i just sends alpha i to negative alpha i. Where does it send alpha j? It sends it to alpha j minus 2 alpha j comma alpha i alpha i. So this is alpha j minus 2 times this cosine right here, plus 2 times this cosine. Okay. And so I really can think of sigma i as taking a linear combination of alpha i and alpha j and just acting by this matrix. Minus alpha i, alpha j, 2c alpha i, alpha j. This is a, this is a two dimensional thing. And sigma i just takes this vector and multiplies by, th by this thing. Now, basically, I do the same computation for sigma j. And what I get is that it's basically the same thing, but backwards. According to my notes, there's a minus here. 
So we'll have to wait. No, no, no. Sigma j is. No, no. Sigma i sends me to minus 1, 0. Sigma 2 sends me to this is a minus 2c and 1. And so sigma i multiplies by this matrix. Sigma j multiplies by this matrix. Okay. And so if I want to check that sigma i sigma j to the m is 1, what I do is that I multiply this matrix by this matrix and then I raise that to the mij and that should give me the identity matrix that's what I would have to prove and this I actually did prove, prove correctly that day so you can go back to the notes and but remember what I did is I just told you what the eigenvalues of this thing were that's how you raise a power a matrix to the nth power is you diagonalize it if you can and this thing we did diagonalize, and we got that the eigenvalues were exactly the rotations by, and they were e to the two pi i over m. Okay. So that shows this thing, which shows this thing, and which shows the proposition. Okay. So that's the correct proof, and I think it'll be the only time that we have to work this hard. On, on the actual representation. Now that we know the representation works, we can just use it. And, and we'll see that using it is much easier than proving it. Okay. This was the right reduction to a two dimensional case. That was the thing that got messed up yeah. the last time we tried this. Yeah. Yeah, so last time what I what I missed was was this part. I just I just had these zeros in the matrix that, that I was just I just copied them down wrong and so I thought the proof was easier than that.